Elon Musk's company Neuralink has just received FDA approval to start testing brain chip implants in humans. This is important because Neuralink is working on helping blind people see and solving many types of neurological disorders like depression, dementia, seizures, strokes, and eventually helping paralyzed people walk. You may have seen a couple years ago, they implanted two chips in a monkey to play a video game with just its mind. And now that same concept will be tested in paralyzed patients so they can do daily tasks on a computer without needing their limbs. Neuralink is a small but mighty company with grand ambitions. The company was started in 2016 by Elon Musk and several others, and now has offices in Silicon Valley, California, and Austin, Texas. This major milestone of getting FDA approval is a huge step in bringing this amazing technology to those who need it most. Welcome to Neuropod, a channel covering all topics related to Elon Musk's brain-machine interface company, Neuralink. In this update episode, I'll share a clip of Neuralink's head neurosurgeon, Dr. Matt McDougall, discussing the safety of the implants. We'll look at a close-up view of Neuralink's electrode threads. And for those who don't know, these are the threads that are connected to the implanted chips and essentially get sewn into the brain with the Neuralink robot. I'll show a picture of Neuralink's mock operating room and some short videos of Neuralink's animals in action. Then, have you ever wondered if your head would get too hot while charging your Neuralink? I'll share a clip of what the heat map of a Link implant looks like when it's charging. And then we'll finish off the episode with a few cool things, one of which is a video clip of Dr. McDougall sharing his primary motivation for working with Neuralink. The safety of the device I would absolutely vouch for uh, from you know the hundreds of surgeries that I've personally done with this. Uh, I, I think it's much safer than many of the industry standard FDA approved uh, surgeries that I routinely do uh, on on patients that you know are are no one even thinks twice about their standard of care. Uh, Neuralink has already reached, in my mind, uh, a safety threshold that is far beyond uh, a commonly accepted safety uh, threshold. Neuralink has started to share more details about the tech they're using and building. One post from their Tech Tuesday series on Twitter gives us a close-up, zoomed-in view of the electrode threads they insert into the brain. Neuralink says, Our thin, flexible threads are a few red blood cells wide, minimizing the brain's response to them. Before I read the rest of this post, I reiterate this fact that the smaller the threads are, the less likely it is that the brain will have a severe immune response. That is, if the threads are small enough, the brain may not even recognize that they're there. And of course, if the brain doesn't know something's there, it's not going to try and attack that something. For some reference, principal investigator at Neuralink, Dan Adams, added this. The rectangular hole at the end of each thread is about 15 micrometers wide. A human red blood cell is about 8 micrometers in diameter. And 1 micrometer equals 1 1,000th one of a millimeter. Also, one more thing I should mention is that another BCI device called a deep brain stimulator has leads that are around 800 times thicker in diameter. And that device is already able to treat neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease. Imagine how much better Neuralink will be able to do. The original post continues on to say, we use scanning electron microscopy to verify process control, understand defects, and sometimes take glamour shots. Fortunately, more info about the threads were given with this next post. In this video, we can see Neuralink testing their threads. They say, we use dynamic mechanical analyzers to fatigue test our threads and identify changes in their mechanical properties over time. It's hard to spot, but here you can see us testing a thread by emulating the brain motion due to our heartbeat at 1 Hz and an accelerated test at 10 Hz. These threads need to not only be able to last for a long time, but they're also in quite a harsh environment. The brain is also not stationary. As the post alludes to, even when we quote-unquote aren't moving, our heartbeat is causing motion. Furthermore, since Neuralink wants to design these devices where anyone could get one, people will need to be able to go about their daily activities and even play sports while a Neuralink or two are implanted. As such, these threads need to be robust, yet flexible to move with the body, and last a long time. If you're interested in learning whether you may qualify for the Neuralink clinical trials, apply to join the patient registry at www.neuralink.com patient-registry.
Anyone within the United States who is at least 18 years old and the age of majority in their state who is able to consent and who has quadriplegia, paraplegia, vision loss, hearing loss, and or the inability to speak is invited to participate in the patient registry. Here's a picture of Neuralink's mock operating room. Neuralink says, we practice surgeries on proxies with all the hardware and instruments needed in our mock OR in the engineering space. This helps us rapidly test and benchmark surgical improvements. A great surgery is a boring one, and practice makes perfect. As Neuralink discussed multiple times throughout their November 22 show and tell event, they are doing all they can to test the devices in the lab prior to testing in animals. By creating fake brains that have similar material characteristics to actual brains, they can learn how to optimize the efficiency and safety of their surgeries. This is a picture of the brain proxy that I took when I attended the event at headquarters last year. Look at Neuralink's monkey named Pager. He celebrated his 12th birthday foraging for treats. This is the same monkey from a couple years ago that I showed earlier. He had two Neuralinks implanted and was thus able to play a video game with just his mind. This is just one of the many animal models that Neuralink has been testing their devices on. Prior to getting FDA approval, the team has been testing in the laboratory environment and has also tested in rats, pigs, sheep, and monkeys. This is what Neuralink's newest wireless charger looks like. As you can see from this looping video, the surface area of the charger is larger than the link implant. Neuralink posted this saying, we test the thermal performance of our implants to ensure safety and improve efficiency. Here, we are taking infrared images to detect hotspots on the bottom surface of an implant while charging with the charger coil in different positions. Stay cool. You might be wondering how this charging would take place in practice. For Neuralink monkeys, they sit on branches as shown in this video. Uh, the troop has been trained to charge themselves. So let's see how Pager charges his implant. On the right, we're streaming real-time diagnostics from Pager's N1. When he climbs up and sits below the coil, you can see the charger automatically detect his presence and transition from searching to charging. We see the regulated power output on a scale of zero to one and the current driven into his battery. And for humans, the plan is to have the charger inside some type of headwear, whether that be a nightcap or a baseball cap. This is the primary thing that drives Dr. McDougall to work with Neuralink. I love the idea down the road, and we're talking, you know, a 10 year, maybe 20 year time frame of uh, humans just getting control over some of the horrible ways that their brains go wrong, right? So uh, I think everybody at this point has either known someone or second order known someone, a friend of a friend, who has been touched by addiction or depression, suicide, uh, obesity. These functions of the brain or, or malfunctions of the brain are what drives me. These are the things that I want to tackle in my career. I also often get asked about the pros and cons of surgically implanted devices versus non-invasive devices. Dr. McDougall articulated this nicely. He shared the primary reason why invasive brain-machine interfaces are more appealing than non-invasive BMIs or wearable headsets. Now that's a useful way to think about these assistive devices. How much information are you able to get in, into the brain and out of the brain usefully? Um, and right now that, that number is uh, very small even compared to the old modems. Uh, but you have to ask yourself when you're looking at a technology, what's the ceiling? What's the theoretical maximum? And for a lot of these technologies, the theoretical maximum is, is uh, very low, disappointingly low, even if it's perfectly executed and, and perfectly um, developed as a technology. And I think the thing that attracts a lot of us to a technology like Neuralink is that the ceiling is incredibly high. There's no obvious reason that you can't interface with millions of neurons uh, as this technology is refined uh, and, and developed further. So um, that's the kind of wide band, you know, high bandwidth brain interface that you want to develop if you're talking about um, an, a semantic prosthetic, uh, 
an AI assistant to your cognitive abilities. Uh, you know, the more sci-fi things that we think about in the coming decades. Um, so uh, the, it's an important caveat when you're evaluating these technologies. You really want it to be something that you can expand off into the sci-fi. And three last things to wrap up the episode. Elon saw and liked the latest video I posted on Twitter. Please consider following at Neuropod as this is where I'll post the most timely updates. And the second thing is I was interviewed by Michael Mataluni on his show called The Singularity Lab. Mike's an excellent interviewer, so I encourage you to check out that with the link in the description. And the third thing is I want to encourage anyone who is inspired by Neuralink's general mission to end suffering due to many neurological diseases to apply to join the team. You know, encourage anyone who is, you know, excited about things like that, you know, especially mechanical engineers, software engineers, robotics engineers, come to the Neuralink website and look at the jobs we've got. We need the brightest people on the planet working on these, the hardest problems uh, in the world, uh, in my opinion. And so uh, if you want to work on this stuff, come help us. You don't need to be a fantastic neurosurgeon or have a deep expertise in a brain related field. Instead, they're looking for passionate people who care deeply about the mission of the company. The team is still quite small at around 300 employees. By comparison, Tesla has around 130,000. My name is Ryan Tanaka. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to stay informed about Neuralink.